Hello, this is Clint Halstead, and this is an introduction to microprocessors video series. And we're using uh, designing embedding systems with PIC microcontrollers, principles, and applications. Se second edition with Tim Wilmshurst. We're currently we're going to cover uh, 2.5 to 2.7 in the book. This section will cover pipelining, external reset, and internal reset circuitry. <coughs> Okay, so a microcontroller is a sequential state machine. <clears throat> so that means that it um, it follows an order, uh, a sequential uh, process from one step to the next. And that sequential process, if if you study sequential processes, you'd know that uh, every sequential process has to have something to set the sequence in order. Uh, so the the clock is that thing that sets the sequence or the heartbeat. So um, <clears throat> the clock is used to set uh, the instructions that get executed one after another. So every time a clock uh, goes from low to high, that, that edge creates a, a, a pulse or a heartbeat um, uh, for the next instruction to be executed. Now there's several things we need to know about how that process works. <clears throat> Number one is <clears throat> when a microprocessor is ex executing code, it uh, the faster the clock is running, or or the faster those instructions are being executed, the more power is consumed. So in today's devices, handheld devices where power is is, is of utmost concern, we want to make sure that we don't. Uh, have a frequency of that heartbeat be too fast. Um, we only want it to be the frequency that's needed for the application. So if it's a wristwatch, you know, maybe the frequency could be slow. If it's a iPad or something like that, then the frequency would be need, need to be high in order to meet all the uh, requirements that, for speed. <clears throat> and sometimes the devices will cycle their clock either faster or slower to, depending on the speed requirement. That's what happens in a computer many times is um, when you're using the computer the clock goes really to the maximum and then when, you, when it's kind of an, in an idle state or you're just viewing something on the screen it may the clock may go down to a lower frequency but in this case uh, we're going to on most of the things we did we're just going to have a fixed clock frequency board where we're going to have to set that clock frequency some way and I, we'll talk about how to do that a little bit later but the power consumption is proportional to the voltage uh, VC, the VCC squared times the frequency of the clock. So that's the equation for, for the power. So it is directly proportional to the frequency. Now the actual instruction cycle or machine cycle is, is going to be actually one-fourth of the main oscillator frequency. So if you set a, a frequency of 4 megahertz for example, well the instruction cycle is, is only going to be 1 megahertz. Okay? So for a 20 megahertz crystal or clock speed it's going to only be 5. So that's don't forget the one-fourth rule there. <clears throat> okay, next we're going to start talking about um, the instruction cycle and the pipelining. Um, here's a block diagram that shows the instruction register. So how, how do instructions get implemented in a microprocessor? Well, you have to write code in either C or assembly. That's going to go up here. <clears throat> so your assembly, your code is going to go in this block, okay? That's going to be downloaded through your PIC hit 3. You're going to connect your PIC hit 3 to the microprocessor. Um, you're going to have a USB cable. <coughs> it's going to go to your computer. So, because this, this could be your computer, your PC, um, and you're going to have a USB cable. Okay, and then that, you're going to write the code on your PC in the .asm format, which is assembly or a .c format. <clears throat> and that's going to get downloaded through your USB cable through the PIC kit 3. Okay, it's going to go into your flash memory inside of the microprocessor. Now when you when you turn on the chip and apply power to the chip, what's going to happen is it's going to start executing code from from the zero location. So the very first uh, spot is going to be zero. That's what the reset function does. Is it sets the instruction 
uh, or the program counter, I'm sorry, the program counter gets set to zero. <coughs> now, when the very first clock comes in, it's going to take whatever is the very first instruction and it's going to populate that. This is called a fetch. Okay, so we're going to fetch uh, whatever memory location is pointed to by the program counter. In this case, it would be zero. And that value, uh, the first line of code may be a zero, one, for example, hex or something. Or uh, it could be anything. Remember, the address of that is zero, but the actual contents of that code may be something different. So that's going to get populated in the instruction register. Um, and that's called the fetch cycle. Now the next cycle is going to be the execute cycle. After, and they're, they're separated by, um, that happens in uh, two clocks, so it takes two clock cycles to do that. So the first cycle is going to be um, a fetch, so we'll just call that an F for fetch. So the first cycle you're going to fetch the instruction and then the next cycle uh, you're going to execute. So you have a fetch and then an execute. So it takes two of those instruction cycles to do that. So if your main oscillator frequency is, uh, it's, remember it's going to be four times as great. So here this is an example of your main oscillator maybe uh, four megahertz but then this one would be one megahertz because it's going to be divided by four and then it takes as far as your instruction goes then it's going to take two cycles to execute that but something called pipelining allows us to fetch okay and then execute the previously fetched instruction so if this is fetch zero, then this would be execute one. This could be fetch, uh, and then you're going to have fetch one, and then execute uh, zero. So that's called the pipeline. We'll, we'll have another slide to show that. So what's actually happening is you fetch during one cycle, one clock cycle, the first clock cycle, you fetch the the code from the flash and put it in the instruction register. And then the next clock cycle, you actually execute that. Now, ex by execute, we mean those values actually gets populated to your addressing. It gets populated to your ALU. They propagate through because it takes time. So those signals take time to propagate through. Okay. And then <clears throat> once it gets executed on the next clock, then the W register is going to have its new value. So this is the result register. So, for example, this could be a plus function something like that and um, <clears throat> then when it executes it's going to add the two numbers and then populate the W register whereas this would be the fetch instruction this would be the execute instruction or cycle so this is kind of just shows the pipelining this is called instruction pipelining this speeds up the process of this allows you to execute instruction every cycle otherwise it would take you two cycles but there is something called a flush. When anytime that you you have a call routine, it's going to you're going to have to have a flush instruction first. So let's just look at this command: move w to l 55 hex. That means the first cycle is going to <coughs> be um, a fetch instruction. So you're going to fetch this command from flash. In the next cycle, then you can execute this command. So it takes two two cycles to ex execute that one command. So this is the second second cycle. However, instead of having to wait to your second cycle to fetch the next instruction, you can actually fetch this instruction, the move WF port B, at the same time you're executing one. That way, uh, your very next clock cycle, which is three, then you can go ahead and execute that move WF command. And at the same time you're doing that, you can fetch the, the next command, which is going to be call sub 1. Okay, so you're going to fetch this call sub 1, then you're going to execute it down here on uh, the next clock cycle, which is going to be the fourth clock cycle. Or not clock cycle, but internal instruction cycle. Um, 
<clears throat> but once you call this command, you, you get the call command, you're going to, to fetch, as you're, as you're executing this call command, you're going to be fetching this uh, bit set if false command. But however, you're going to have to flush that one out because the call command is actually going to take you to a completely different place in your code, which may be down here somewhere. So you may have your next instruction down here, may be another, another move uh, literal command or something, 56 or something, who knows. But um, <clears throat> so since your next command is not going to be bit set f, which is what you fetch, then you have to kind of start over again. Then what that means is you're going to have to fetch uh, your sub 1. Oh, this, this says instruction at sub 1, so actually this arrow should be pointing down to here. So let's go ahead and erase this thing. Okay. So yeah, so your instruction <coughs> is going to be here, so it's going to jump to here, and then that means you're going to have to fetch this one uh, all over again, and you have to kind of just throw away this information because you're not going to actually be executing it. So that's called the flush. <coughs> so that's a description of pipelining. Okay, let's talk about resets, internal resets, external resets, I mean. Every PIC chip has a reset pin. It's usually called uh, Master Clear, MCLR, with a bar over the top of it. Um, these two things are synonymous, either reset bar or MC, M Master Clear bar. So those are your, your reset. That bringing that pin low on your chip will um, force your reset vector or your, force your program counter back to zero. Okay, so your program counter will go to zero, and it'll cause you to start executing at the beginning of your code again. So that's what your, the reset function does, and that happens when this signal is low. So when you're low, when you're a zero or ground, in other words, then that's going to be reset. Now when when this goes to higher logic 1 or 5 volts, um, so logic 1 is 5 volts and then this would be 0 volts. Uh, zero, uh, zero, logic 0 would be 0 volts. There are several different ways to implement a reset circuitry on the outside of your chip. One way is to um, have a capacitor resistor and when you turn on power, and the, the power of the board turns on, there's going to be an RC delay time constant. So it's going to take some time for that capacitor to charge here. So this capacitor is actually going to go up like this. And then uh, there's going to be a comparator inside of the chip that once it reaches that threshold, it's going to cause it to go high. Now why do we want to do that? Because we want to make sure reset stays low um, for a little bit of time to make sure that the, the chip powers up properly. Because if it doesn't, then you can get in a weird unknown state. So you want initially for your chip to be reset. Because when you very first power up your chip, you don't want to be at some random place in your code. You want to always be at the very beginning of your code. So this is called a power on reset. Now another way to do this would be, the problem with this circuitry is when, when your power goes low, it also takes a long time to discharge that capacitor. And... Uh, you won't instantly turn off um, your your code execution. So it's going to take some time for that reset to go low. So a better idea is actually to use a diode. If you use a diode here, um, then once you go low, this diode turns on and discharges this capacitor to about uh, 0 0.7 volts. Okay, so you can imagine this, when this goes to ground, and if this was 5 volts before, well, then the, the dial is going to turn on. It's going to discharge this 5 volts into the ground. Okay? So that's what the diode is for. And sometimes people put a series resistor just to uh, limit any sort of current that may go through your reset pin. <coughs> um, another way to do it with a push button switch, you could have a, have a push button switch here. Push button. Um, and you could. Tie the, have this resistor here to VDD, and then you could have, um, you know, you could have when you push the put but push button, it resets the chip. So that's if you want to have a push button reset. 
once you push this button, it's going to ground this pin. This pin will go low. If you leave the push button high, then it's just going to go to logic one, which is going to be not reset. So that's that's a reset button if you want to do that. Okay, I wanted to talk about, you know, we have this reset circuitry on the chip, but a lot of times this isn't really required because in our labs, a lot of times we're going to have a pick hit three or a pick hit two. And I did want to mention that um, on the pick hit three, one of the the pins is actually a, a master clear. So this this would be routed to your microprocessor on the reset pin. So you have a master clear on your chip, on your micro microcontroller. So this is to say that this is the PIC, the PIC 84A chip. And one of those pins is going to be master clear. So you can wire one of these directly here, and then you can you can reset and clear uh, your part um, through your software control, through your MP Lab program. There's a, a feature on your MP Lab software that will um, force your micro controller into reset or release it from reset. And we'll talk about that when we go over the MP Lab X software. <clears throat> also, it's kind of nice to here as well because your um, your Pick Hit 3 also can provide your VDD power and also your ground. It also your Pick Hit 3 also provides the in, in circuit serial programming uh, data and clock. So we'll talk about this a little bit later when we start talking about the uh, when we start working on the labs. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about, we talked about what's external to the reset. We're going to talk a little bit about what's, what's inside of the chip on the reset side. There's several things that happen. So all of the circuitry on the screen here is actually inside of the 16F84A microcontroller. Um, and these are the external pins. You have VDD, oscillator, master, clear. So this is your reset. Um, this is your power. <clears throat> now, let's just assume for a minute that we want to see some kind of a normal operation of VDD is 5 volts. Um, let's say that we're in clear. So we have the, the reset, the master clear pin pulled low. And we the, the, the signal that actually goes to the internal circuitry is called chip underscore reset. It's inside of the, uh, the chip. So in this case, let's look and see what happens with the logic. So with 5 volts here, you have a VDD rise detect circuit. And this is just like a comparator. And when it sees that you have uh, a correct voltage of 5 volts, then it's going to, um, it's going to set this to, this is going to be a logic 1. You also have a watchdog timer module um, that, that, will, uh, that you may have as well. And we'll talk about watchdog timers later, but just just keep in mind that watchdog timer can affect your reset signal. So that's many times why we want to disable that watchdog timer module because we don't sometimes we don't want this watchdog timer to mess up our reset to keep us from being on or off. Uh, so let's look here. If let's just assume that master clear is low, so we, we want this to be zero. So if this is zero then this is an inverter, so this gives us a 1. This comes in here to the OR gate and gives us a 1. Now we know with an OR gate, if, if even just one input is a 1, then we always get a 1. So we know the output of this will be a 1, which means we know that this set uh, reset latch here is going to be a 1. This inverter makes this a 0, so this 0 goes to this AND gate, and then we have a 0. But now we need to know what is the other state of this reset pin here. So we know that set is a 1. Um, now we need to know what's the value of, of reset. <clears throat> OK, so enable um, power up timer is 0. Let's just assume that the enable power up timer is, is disabled. And the enable OST is, um, is, is disabled as well. So we're going to set those to 0. That means that this OR gate is going to be uh, a 1 on the input here because the 0 gets inverted by the bubble and it turns a 1. And then that gives us a 1 here, gives us a 1 there at the input of this AND gate. Okay? This 0 comes in here to 
this bubble and makes it a 1 and that means we're going to have a 1 on the output of this OR gate. This is going to give us a 1, 1 and a, and a 0. So just because there's just one 0 on the AND gate, that means there's no way the output can be 1. So the, the, the output of this AND gate has to be 0. Okay. <coughs> so now what we're going to get is a <coughs> A set that means that this latch here is going to be set on the Q output so its Q output is going to be set to a 1 because the set is a 1 and the reset to 0 that gives us a 1 on Q now this is Q naught so that means it's going to be the opposite of that so that means it's going to give us a 0 so everything looks good because this matches this 0 matches this 0 so that's what we wanted when we put a 0 here on the input the master clear we want this to say zero. Now, what's obvious is if you enable the power up timer, then you may be able, you may get something other than that. And you have to go through the analysis and, and see that. Um, another thing that could keep you from being reset is is uh, your watchdog timer module as well. So you have to be careful with that. <clears throat> so also notice that. Um, along with the watchdog timer and the VDD rise detect we also have this oscillator power up timer the way this works is it just simply uh, counts your clock cycles and will give you a delay a power up delay and sometimes that's that's needed and we'll talk about that on the next slide here so the way the sequence and the timing works on it is when your VDD reaches a certain threshold that is declared as being good by a comparator then a comparator will set your internal power on reset signal high. Okay, and then um, then there's going to be a little bit of a a delay on your master clear, so they have a delay from here to there. And then you have a power uh, power timer that's going to give you this time, okay, which is set by power up timer, okay, and then you have an oscillator timer. That you have as well, OST. So that that's that timer. So you got these two timers. So that's what gives you those two delays. And those delays just help the chips start up correctly, because um, you always want to have um, you always want to make sure that your power is up and nice and stable before you enable the chip. So th and then then you have finally your internal reset. So your internal reset is the function of all these delays. You have your VDD rising delay. And you have your power up timer delay and your T oscillator uh, delay. And these, these can be set or adjusted if you want to make those shorter, uh, longer, or shorter. It just gives you a little bit of flexibility on when the internal reset occurs in case there's ever any problems with power up. Okay? So thank you for watching this series, and uh, I'll post the next series later. Thank you very much. Um, before we do that, I, for, I forgot, let's just summarize this section really quick. Chapter 2 summary is in this chapter we learned uh, about the PIC mid-range devices. It's a diverse and effective family of microcontrollers. Uh, the 16F84 architecture is representative of all mid-range controllers. It has a hardware structure, uses pipelining and risk instruction set. The PIC 16F84 has a limited set of peripherals but it's chosen for its small and low cost applications. It's a, easy, it's a good chip to learn on because it's not really overwhelming. You can read the data sheet, uh, whereas a lot of the chips have data sheets that may be two or three hundred pages long, whereas this one is within reason. It's a, it's a nice uh, smaller size data sheet that we can uh, really wrap our brains around and, and learn on. Okay. Um, but the, the, the larger family devices are just a subset of, of this one. So even though the 84 is small, well, the 84, everything that's in the 84 is going to be in the larger parts, but the larger parts just add uh, extra peripherals. The 16F84 has three distinct memory technologies. It uses uh, SRAM, Flash, and EEPROM. So the flash is used for program memory, the SRAM is used for file registers, and then EEPROM is used for non-volatile data storage. And then a particular type of memory location is a special function register, 
and that acts as the link between the CPU and the peripherals. Okay, and we talked about those special function registers, like the trist A, the port A, and the status register, and things like that. It controls the peripherals. Uh, and then we have the reset mechanisms, ensure that the CPU st starts running uh, when the appropriate operation conditions have been met. Okay, so we want to make sure that all the voltages are stable and that we can control the reset a little bit in case there's issues or glitches at, at startup. So now we're finally at the end of the chapter two and thank you very much for watching.